Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 311. If you realized how powerful your thoughts are, you would never think a negative thought again. Anonymous. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Black Box. Black Box is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Black Box, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Black Box currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Black Box is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Black Box, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Black Box takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. And today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. If you want access to filmmaking documentaries, feature films about filmmaking, interviews with some of the top screenwriters and filmmakers in Hollywood, as well as educational online courses all in one place, IFH TV is for you. Just head over to IndieFilmHustle.tv. And today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. If you want access to filmmaking documentaries, feature films about filmmaking, interviews with some of the top screenwriters and filmmakers in Hollywood, as well as educational online courses all in one place, IFH TV is for you. Just head over to IndieFilmHustle.tv. Before we get started, guys, I wanted to let you guys know, if you haven't heard, that on the corner of Ego and Desire, the film I shot for about $3,000 and shooting it at the Sundance Film Festival last year is going to be screened at the world's famous Chinese Theater in Hollywood. It's on April 25th, and if you want tickets, please head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash screening, and it'll take you right to the tickets for that event. And afterwards, there's a bonus talk where I'm going to be giving a talk about Shooting for the Mob, my new book, which we'll be selling there as well, doing autograph sessions, Q&As, and we're going to be just kind of getting together with the tribe. You know, I'm going to start doing more of these kind of meetups, live events, kind of things for the tribe, and uh, this is the very first one, so I'm really, really excited. So please, if you're interested, head over to IndieFilmMuscle.com forward slash screening, April 25th at the Chinese Theater in Hollywood. Now, today's guest is author Paul Dudbridge. And he is the author of Making Your First Blockbuster, Write It, Film It, Blow It Up. And in this book, he really goes into what it takes to make a blockbuster. He analyzes old blockbusters and more modern blockbuster films. And if you ever really wanted to know what it takes to actually construct a blockbuster film, a kind of popcorn movie, even on an independent level, this is the episode for you. Paul and I get into a deep rabbit hole of blockbusters and analyzing the old ones, the new ones, and what we can do to add a little bit of blockbuster magic to our independent film. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Paul Dudbridge. I'd like to welcome to the show, Paul Dudbridge, brother. How you doing? Hey, Alex. Awesome. Thanks for having me. How is the weather in the UK today, sir? It's cold. It's very cold. That's I very, been out in it's unseasonably. Is it unseasonably cold? You guys are never cold. It's always sunny and very nice. It's kind of like LA, but different. Uh, it's, it's early January. It's it's really they've got you know they've got all the the salt on the ground for oh. stuff all slipping over and stuff. So yeah, it's pretty it's pretty cold out there. It's uh, I want to. I mean, it, it's cold here for us. We're like forty degrees here, uh, so I don't even know what that's Celsius because we're Americans and that's what we do. But uh, <laughs> but for us, that's pretty cold. But I haven't seen snow uh, since last Sundance. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. No, we haven't had snow here for a, well, a good year, I think. So, oh, really? So it's just cold? Yeah. It's just cold? Yes, yeah, cold. Yeah. Oh, good Lord. So thanks for being on the show, man. I wanted to talk about a couple of books that you've written as well as your time in the business. So 
First off, how did you get into this crazy business? Uh, Well, I've kind of got the classic story. My dad bought a video camera when I was 11 to film Mm -hmm. sports days and holidays and all that. Mm -hmm. And um, my sister and a couple of mates of mine, we put on this play in the back garden and my dad filmed it. And he kind of filmed it. Bless him. I don't know if he's ever going to listen to this, but he filmed the wrong bits. He filmed like the behind the scenes stuff of us preparing and not the actual stuff on stage, as it were. Mm-hmm. And, we, and we were kind of like, oh, he's filmed it wrong. We should do another one. So we made a proper film as it, you know, we kind of tried to do our own Deanna Jones. And um, that's where it started. And we couldn't edit. Everything was cut in camera. Um, so when we stopped, when we started the record button, that's the beginning of the shot. When we hit the stop button, that was the end of the shot. Uh, so it, it was a nice discipline of what's the next shot going to be because we can't cut this. And we would even do our own music. I think we had Axel F from Beverly Hills Cop as like some theme music and stuff like that. And we had this like stereo off camera playing the music and someone was hitting the play button while we were shooting the shot. Mm. And then they would stop. And then obviously when we played it all back, the music would all be sort of stopping and starting and the law- next door neighbor's lawnmower was cutting it out because sometimes it was he was working sometimes it wasn't and it was just this wonderful and you know introduction to the into making films um and then from there each year we kind of did a few different films and then i went to college for a year we kind of i found editing equipment and and just went through there really and then eventually digital came in um but those early years were really quite good for me i think because uh i've only shot on film once but it was a real discipline of <sighs> how how to you know what's your next shot you just can't keep the camera running um how's it and especially even back in the day when you were editing tape to tape you had this master tape and if you made a film that was half hour long you you had to know how long your shots were um and and even we only had two channels of audio so we had one on dialogue one on music and if we had any special effects like sound effects to put in we had to duplicate the the, the, the tracks across to the, another tape and then bring it back in the player and copy it across again. Oh, so yeah. even up the tapes were like fourth generation. <laughs> <laughs> nothing so. is more, nothing is more terrifying than being on a set with a film camera. And I was shooting a commercial uh, and I had to shoot at 120 frames a second. And right. the sound, I still remember the sound of the, that the camera made <laughs> and it's just like zzz. And you just and all you hear is dollar mark, just dollars, yeah. just cash f- just cash flying out, and you're just praying that the film doesn't snap. Like, yeah, right. This is this is this is what we did. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was good times. It's good times. Sure? But it's a, it's a good discipline. It really is. It, it is an amazing discipline. I mean, I I got my start in film mostly, uh, and shot all. That's all we had. So, and then when yeah. I got into digital, it's like wonderful to let it roll and just, Oh, just keep rolling. Just keep rolling. Yeah. And it goes. And, but then when you get into post, cause I'm a post guy, it just takes, yeah. Oh, it takes so forever. Cool. That someone's got to find it. Oh God. It becomes really, you got to be a little bit more disciplined. So when yeah. I shoot now, I'm like, I don't know about you, but when I shoot, I'll, I'll, I'll cut. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, won't, yeah. I won't let it keep going because you're just going to just run through all that crap. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's well, crazy. I think it also, I mean, it is a good discipline to have. And also, I think that when I was cutting that, mm-hmm. when I started editing, I always say to, to young student film directors, if you want to learn how to direct, you need to know how to cut because mm-hmm. you need to know how the shots are going to come together. And we've all been there on sets before where you've got uh, 10 shots to get. The sun's going down. You can only get six. And you, you, you have to do the mental maths in your head and go, well, I could drop that shot. I could cut from that to that, get around that. I could go straight. To, I, could, I need that shot to make the scene work. But I could drop this one. And you can do that maths because you know how to cut. And if you don't know how to cut, you're just going to go, well, I need to shoot everything. Then you run over or you're second guessing yourself. So and just just cut and cut and cut. Because I know, you know, and if you're a good editor, you're a good director. And I think that's the secret. No, I agree with you. I, I started off as an editor. And it's helped me dramatically as a director because you just kind of know where to stop the cut because you're like, oh, yeah. you're kind of editing on set in your mind. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes I, as a DP as well, I sometimes shoot for other directors. And if you're working for a director that knows editing and I'd say to them, do you want to go again on that wide? And they go, no, I'll be out of there. I'll be out of there by then. I'll be on the single. And they know where they're going to cut. So we don't have to do the shot again. Mm-hmm. But if you're working with a slightly newer, inexperienced director, they go, oh, do you think we should go again? I think we should do the wide again, that two-minute wide shot. 
for another take uh, because they don't quite know how it's going to come together. And, and that's where you run over and things like that. So it's really good uh, foundation, I think, editing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and before you had to, you know, find an Avid system or find a flatbed to sneak in at night or in the early mornings yeah. or on weekends to practice on where now sure. literally you can edit on your phone uh, but or even you know get free software like Resolve or Final Cut for like 200 bucks. I mean, yeah. it's well, ridiculous. Even Avid, I think Media First, I think is free. It's a download. Oh, I they started they're... giving, they finally started giving something away for free at Avid. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a break. Oh no, don't, don't get me started with Avid. Please don't get me started with okay. Avid. I can't I just I, I just can't even with them. But anyway. <laughs> sure. What do you guys whole slide. That's a whole other episode for a whole other time. What do you guys what do you edit on? <clears throat> Avid. No, oh, you're an Avid. And it's okay. Look, I have no problem with the tool. I have a problem with the way the company is run and they charge sure. so much money and they just beat you down and all this, and they doesn't play nicely with others. But I'm just gonna say, would you agree with that with visual effects and other things like that? Jumping, you know. Yeah, sometimes the workflow isn't as smooth. I mean, obviously, if it's in Premiere, you can jump to a After Effects and, and or, stuff like or that. Resolve or Final yeah. Cut or something like that. Um, yeah. But this so, this conversation, you see, this is what happens with two directors. Uh, or two filmmakers who you know who've been around the block a couple times. We just start chatting. It's gonna it's gonna it's gonna derail a couple times. I'm sure. Sure, sure. Um, all right. So let's talk about um, the first book you wrote, which is um, shooting better movies. Uh, how yeah. did that come to life, and what made you want to write that book? Okay. Well, I suppose there's two sort of uh, strands to that question. Is one is uh, how I came to write the book because about 15 years ago I started teaching. I, uh, there's a, there was a, a television workshop here in the UK, and I started doing some sessions there, teaching young students sort of between sort of 16 and 26, the beginnings of filmmaking. <clears throat> and off the back of that, I started doing some teaching at universities and other colleges. So I had this compilation of notes, handouts, sessions, uh, and I kind of was slowly beginning to understand how the information should be taught. Because it's okay to know it, but actually getting it across to someone that doesn't know it and in a way that they can digest it easily is the secret. And I kind of, after, over the years, I had all this information and I thought, you know, what? I'm going to write a book. I didn't know anything about publishing. Um, I didn't know where to begin, but I thought I'm just going to write this thing on spec. So over about a year and a half, I just wrote this thing. It was quite big. But at the back of the book, I wanted to have these interviews with people in the business, camera assistants, graphers, directors, etc., and I knew uh, uh, just to make my time professionally, I could contact people and say, hey, would you want to be interviewed for my book? But one of the things I really wanted was the Hollywood perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, about two years before that, I'd contacted a producer on Facebook called Pendentium, who was a writer producer. He went, made one of the films, my favorite films growing up, which was Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves back in like 1991. I love oh, that yeah. movie. And I, I, I emailed Penn and just on Facebook, I said, look, just to say, I love Prince of Thieves. I use it in, in my teaching materials because you know it's a good you know it's got a whole end section with uh, Robin Hood when he's rescuing all his merry men at the end, mm -hmm. and it's, the way the director Kevin Reynolds shot it, it's some great sort of uh, examples of orientation and things like that. Anyway, he got back to me and he was like, "Hey, awesome, nice to meet you." He's from the UK. He moved over to the states when he was younger, and that was it. And that was about two years ago. So anyway, when I came around to writing this book, I was like, "Do you know what? I could email Pendentium. He could be." my interview for the Hollywood perspective for the back of my book. But, and this is something that I tell students now when I'm, I'm talking about don't answer no for the other person, which is I, I, I was scared. I was scared about emailing him because <laughs> he's going to say, no, get out of town. What are you talking about? Who, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and it took me six weeks I was thinking, he's never going to reply. He's never going to do it, even though I kind of had this contact with him, but that was two years ago. So anyway, I wasted six weeks. And then one day I thought, you know what, I'm going to do it. So I came home and I, and I emailed him and asked him if he would do the interview. And I emailed him. I remember the timeline. I emailed him at two minutes past five. By 11 minutes past five, we had a date for the interview. <laughs> and I had wasted six weeks, right? And it took us like nine minutes. And he fired straight back, hey, Paul, sounds awesome. I'll call you Friday from LA. We're chat. Speak then. And I was like, that was a lesson for me 
forget the book for a second. It was just a lesson in you never know. Don't answer no for the other person because that could be a, an actor you want to approach. That could be a distributor. That could be a, anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to try it. Anyway, so I interviewed Penn. He was a lovely guy. Um, he you know, gave me loads of wisdom. And at the end of the interview, he said, what's your plans for the book? And I said, I don't know. I might release it online, do an ebook." And he said, look, I, I wrote a book called Writing the Alligator on screenwriting. Um, you should speak to my publisher. Mm -hmm. And I was like, OK, and who's your publisher? Anyway, he gave me the name of his publisher, which was Michael Vesey. And I've got nine of their books on my shelf. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I was like, OK. Uh, anyway, about four months goes past. I finished the book and I emailed Penn and go, look, I'm ready to email the Michael VC. Can I have their details? And it went from there. And then I got a phone call from Michael VC, the, the president of the, the publishing company. And he rang me to say, well, we like your book. Yeah, we'll take it. That's, that's awesome. How, that's how the yeah. book got, got put in. That's that's yeah. awesome. Well, I've, I, go ahead. I was going to say, all credit to Penn. I mean, I've emailed him many times since for advice and to congratulate him on stuff and we've stayed in touch and he's just awesome. Um, so I owe it all to him. No, it's, it's funny cause you know, doing what I do now, you know, having interviews and, and requesting people like to come on and some people come at requests of me, but you know, I'll go after big guests and I'll just well, like, I I've learned to just ask. Yeah. You know, as long as you're providing some sort of value and you're just not a, like a an energy sucker, as I always call them, like these yeah. people, are like I need. Can you call up Steven Spielberg for me? I know you worked with them on this one movie. Can yeah. you? You can't do that. But if you come uh, from a really authentic, humble place and just go, look, I yeah. need help or I need this, I'm gonna say nine out of ten times. You yeah. Know, they if they have the time, yeah. or they'll make the time. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um. So so that's how the book got into the world. Well, let me talk a few things about it that are in the book. What are some sure. common traits you see in student films? And I have seen way too many student films in my day, including oh. my own. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, yeah, there is a chapter at the back of the book, Common Traits. And I would say, I, don't know, I think there's about 20 in there. I would say 19 of them I've made myself and the, in the mistakes I've made. And the common traits are like bad sound, <laughs> um, you know, and, it, and, and and even just like bad, you know, bad photography, overexposed, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, you don't need the big lighting kit to worry, you know, to sort of solve that. You could just move your actor a foot to the left so they're out of that light or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's just a, attention to detail a little bit like that on both those fronts. Uh, I see 239 widescreen a lot. <laughs> when it's shot on an iPhone? <laughs> Yeah, and it's like I can get that, and it, and but it, you have to come at the aspect ratio from the point of view of the story, I think. Right. Um, however, it, it is I've recently read a, an article in American Cinematographer where they said back in like the early nineties, I think there was something like seventy five percent of the films were shot one eighty five, mm -hmm. and twenty five percent were shot two thirty nine, or something like that. And then now it's the complete opposite, and you get romantic comedies shot two thirty nine. Every and and there was a film that I think went to Sundance last year, and they literally said we shot two thirty nine because we wanted to add that extra production value. Nothing to do with the story, nothing to do with <sighs> any sort of narrative. Right. It's just we did it because we people do associate it with higher production value. Um, what was the other things like? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I did as a kid, we'd shoot. We wouldn't make stories that were suitable for the age range that we were. So I had like my 16 year old schoolmates playing police detectives <laughs> and stuff like that. And unfortunately, we had, it was a, around the time when Tarantino was quite popular. Oh, so yes. every suits, everything was swearing, everything was f this, blood everywhere, know. right? Yeah, blood everywhere. Pointing and gun down the barrel thing, yeah. you know. And it's funny now where you see, I see even movies now, and I'm like someone's let on the floor and put they put a gun down the barrel and it's like that was old hat in 91 right. and now you know what i mean and it's like you need to find a different way of doing that or you know holding it on the gun on the side um all that kind of stuff so yeah there's a few traits that you know what's the other one i suppose getting hung up on kit mm. um a, i speak to a lot of students and the first thing out of their mouth is we're shooting on the red yeah oh. and, oh, and we're in 4K, and you kind of go, well, what's the story first? Because you can shoot on the red if you want, but if you don't know where to put the camera, you don't get your coverage. 
it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. I know. But they think that somehow you're going to say, oh, you're in that league, you're quite established, you must be good if you shoot on the red. Nothing against red. Um, so it's those sorts of things that you kind of find cropping up. And, you know, I hold my hands up. I made half of those mistakes, you know? No, no, without without question. And uh, I, I mean, I've done full podcast episodes on gear porn. And like, and the whole like, you know, people obsessed with gear. And at the end of the day, like, I shot my my latest feature. I shot on a um, on a pocket camera, 1080p. Right. Yeah, and it worked beautifully, and it looked stunning. And I yeah. didn't shoot a two three nine, <laughs> though I could have because it was a very picturesque, you know, thing. Yeah. Um, but that's the other thing when you see it, when you see a, sh- a student film. Or, or an indie film even, uh, you know, the, when they're starting out where you see the 239 aspect ratio and they're in a bedroom. I'm like, yeah. that, like, there's no reason for no. that. Like, yeah. if you're out in the desert or when you're in a jungle yeah. and there's mountain ranges and it's like this epic vista, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I get it. I get it. But yeah. <laughs> when you're shooting against a like, white wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think it's the tail wag the dog quite a lot there. And I think... You know, I speak to a lot of DPs and they talk about vintage glass and, yeah. and things like that. And, that. you know, you read interviews with like Roger Deakins and he's talking about shooting on like Alex, just on primes, just clear, brand new primes. And he said he doesn't understand the notion of putting vintage lenses on a brand new 4K Alexa. It's like drinking champagne from a polystyrene beaker. You want to get the best image you can and... And, and then if you want to do any effects in, the, in post or grade and you want to do anything, you know, subtle to the image, you can. But you want to start with the best quality. Um, so there's lots of, you know, points of view and pros and cons to all of that. But getting hung up on gear is a big thing. I yeah. always I always use um, Tangerine as in a model. Like, look what they did with an iPhone. Look what Sean Baker did with an iPhone. And, and he just had a great story. I mean, the story yeah. was so well done, and it, and that the style of the film made sense, and and he didn't lead with that. That's the other thing people don't understand. Like, no one knew that film was shot on an iPhone until yeah. the very end of the first screening, where it said, "Oh, by the way, we shot this on an iPhone." Where he could have easily led with that. Yeah, and it, but then it would have been a gimmick, wouldn't it? It would have right. been a, "Hey, look what I've done," and no one would be looking at the story. Hmm. Um, and it's a nice little bonus at the end as opposed yeah. to leading with it, which is one of the things I always see filmmakers do now is like, oh, I've made my movie for the cheapest. I made it for $5. I made it for <laughs> – for, and you know what? When Robert Rodriguez did it in 91 with Mariachi, I made a $7,000 feature film. That's because feature films, you could not make anything even remotely close for that budget. And by the way, I always tell people the movie that you saw – was not a seven thousand dollar movie. That was a one point five million dollar movie after they redid all the posts. Yeah, yeah. You know, all the sound. The sound alone was like a million because they yeah. they had to reconstruct the entire soundtrack from scratch. They ADR'd the yeah. entire movie, but that's yeah. a whole other conversation. Well, but 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 that that kind of like oh, I made this movie for like you know the cheapest thing ever. Mm-hmm. It it does not hold weight anymore. I think that's yeah. another big trait that a lot of Filmmakers think that they're like, oh, I made this movie. I'm like, look how cool I am. I was able to do yeah. this for $5. I'm like, that's great. What's the story? No one cares yeah, anymore. Cool. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it just all comes back to story, story, story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what's the message? And I saw, I saw a film recently at a film festival. And technically, I have, it was, I think they did a shot on the Alexa. It was gorgeous. The photography was gorgeous. Sound. It was basically a feature that you would see in the cinema, mm-hmm. but a short form. Great composition, great grading, et cetera, et cetera. But two things. One, I didn't know what was going on. And second, I was so bored. Mm-hmm. And it was just a, it was just one of those things where I'm going, it, you've got the skills, you've got the talent, you've got the gear, but what story are you telling uh, you know, I'm not engaged. Uh, you know, what's up with that? So I think it's important to look at story first, and then, you know, I think people will be uh, they, they get adjusted to the image quite quite easily. There's a good interview in one of Michael Vesey's books, actually, um, called Cinematography for Directors, where uh, DP John Seal is talking with uh, Roger Deakins, mm-hmm. and Roger Deakins was all about prime lenses, and he hates zooms. 
And John Seal's a Zooms man. He doesn't use primes. Mm. And it used to be back in the day that Zooms would have lesser quality because there's a bit yeah. more glass to get mm-hmm. through. And he was saying, but after about three or four seconds of looking at that opening image, the audience goes, okay, that's the quality. What's the story? And they won't be, con- they, at the f- you know, 50 minutes in, they won't be going, oh, but look at that grain or look at the, le- the quality is not great. They, that becomes the, the norm. It becomes the standard. So it's not about whether it was Zooms or Primes. It's about the story because the audience will get past the image very quickly. Without without question, people will always forgive a bad image, but they will not yeah. forgive bad sound. No, no, yeah, bad sound. It's, I mean, Blair Witch Project looks looks horrible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, pa- pa- Paranormal Activity was shot on like you know nanny cams, you know, yeah. but the sound was great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> w- w- yeah. without question. Now, can yeah. you give me uh, some tips on directing actors? Because I think filmmakers in general. Uh, actors are, are are like they only fo- they only focus on the gear they only focus on on lenses and and light and all lights and all that kind of stuff and they and they and then if you're lucky they also focus on story sure but the actor is this kind of almost yeah. mythical thing for especially for fir- you know first time filmmakers and people starting out they're very intimidated they speak another language I mean they sure, can, sure. they speak another so I'd but, love to hear your thoughts on it awesome well first of all I think uh, don't be frightened of it. <laughs> um, I think it's it's listen to them because I've seen a lot of a lot of directors on set talking at length to the actor uh, on this is covers a kind of various uh, layers here. Um, one is telling them what they want, and then basically you haven't given the actor the opportunity to present what they prepared because you might spend 10 minutes saying, look, actor, I want you to do this, this, and this. And that was exactly what they were going to do. So you've now just killed 10 minutes. And also you haven't trusted the actor to go, well, this is what I prepared. So take one should be, well, show me what you've got. And you go, hey, brilliant, let's shoot. Or tweak here and there. Um, And intellectual chit-chat is a big thing, like, it should always be about what the behavior you want from the actor, not talking about what they had for breakfast, what the meaning of that tie is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and there's a wonderful quote that I used in my first book from a book called uh, A Sense of Direction by a, a director called William Ball. Mm-hmm. And he would say to the, the actor, if they started getting into an intellectual discussion, about what the character means by this and what that represents, just say to them, show me, show me what you mean. And that would probably stop the conversation because there's no way of performing the action and saying the line that can demonstrate what they're saying because it's all intellectual. There's no behavior component to that. Um, So it all has to be about the behavior. If there's a behavioral change behind your direction, then it's good direction. If your behavior doesn't change, then what are you talking about? Um, and direction should be about 10 seconds long. Mm-hmm. If it's anything over 10 seconds, you've got a problem because you need to talk at length about something that should have been talked about in rehearsal, should have been discussed on the phone before you went to set or whenever you have the chance to talk to the actor. So it's one of those things where you just need to nudge them either way rather than say, right, let's take this whole scene apart and the whole character apart and let's discuss you know, the, you know what the scene's about, and you're just wasting time. You're wasting daylight, uh, or film, burning film, <laughs> whatever. It be. Um, yeah. No, I, I actually I had the I had the um, pleasure to interview Robert Forster. Um, right. Uh, and he was in Tarantino's Jackie Brown, among a billion other things he's done in his career. He's an amazing actor, and I at, at the time I was just like, "Can you give me the best direction Tarantino ever gave you?" And he said, the best, I, I've, I've worked with a lot of directors, Alex, and the best direction I've ever heard was from Quentin when he said to me, he would whisper it right before the take, right before he yell action. He goes, make me believe it. Right. And that was, that was it. That was okay. it. That was it. I was like, wow, that's, that's a really good, I mean, you've really got to trust your actor. And, sure. and, and of course, the, the caliber of actors he works with, you know, when Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio are on set, you pretty much just, you know. Let them do it. <laughs> Yeah, let them do it. I tell you, there's, there was an example I had in the book. I had an actress on a show that we did a couple of years ago, and mm-hmm. what we had to do was she was looking at a clock mm-hmm. that the clock had stopped, 
and she she's rummaging through these drawers in this kitchen. She looks up to see that the clock has stopped. She, as a, the actor, she saw that it had stopped, and then she went back to her business. But the editor and me needed to be able to cut in on her close up to the shot of the clock, and she didn't hold that look at the clock long enough for me to cut in. She did it how she would do in real life. And for me to say, can you look at the clock longer, suddenly would become quite static. She would look up and her face would lock in place. It would be quite static. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be flowing with the character. So I, what I said to her was, just make sure that the clock is stopped. So then she looked up and she had to look at it in character, as it were, in the, it built in that into the motion of her actions of looking up. She, she, she held the look long enough to go, yes, that second hand isn't moving. Now I'll get back to my business. And it was long enough. And it's an exercise in what they call not giving result direction, which is mm -hmm. directing your actor just to get a result from them. So, you know, and, and one of the things I say in, the, in my book, Shooting Better Movies, is to use action verbs because action verbs are a great tool for the actor. So you might say... Uh, interrogate your daughter as to where she's been, you know, why she's come home late. Mm -hmm. And it's what an action verb does is a great tool because there's a connotation attached to that word. So when I say interrogate, I think of police. Right. And the police would go, they would lock eye contact, they would be quite firm, they would be quite assertive. Um, and what you can then do, if the actor's giving it too much and you want them to be uh, of a lesser intensity, you can say quiz your daughter about where she's been. Now, quiz, to me, I think of a, a, a pub quiz or a, a TV show where right. the questions are asked, which is not, there's not too much intensity to it. So then the performance is lessened without saying, talk quieter, look away at that line, etc., which would be considered result direction. Yeah, it's like, act like you're angry at your daughter for being late, as opposed to, that doesn't give you the same meats to play with as an actor as, like, no. interrogate. Yeah. And it's, uh, what action verbs do is they give you that emotional core mm -hmm. which you want the actor to find. And the, all you've got to say is that one verb, and the actor goes, I get it. And so, so I, what I do when I go through a script is I might have two pages, and I'll say, what's the character doing there? For the first half of the page, they're trying to convince them to marry them or convince them to go away. Then when they're not replying or they're, they're not taking them up, then they sort of plead with them. Mm -hmm. So you find those two or three action verbs that might help when you're on set and you need to direct the actor, you can just find that verb. Um, and, I, and that keeps the direction short. So you're not trying to split it apart and talk at length. Now, I, this, is a, some, this is a topic that I love always to asking directors specifically is, one, how do you deal with a difficult actor? An actor who is not doing what you're doing, what they want, or if they're being disrespectful, or they're not just listening and they're making the director look bad on set. And two, how would you deal with that same situation with a crew member, like a DP who doesn't respect the director or, a, or an art director or, you know, or a producer on set that's just giving you headache? Because as first time directors, look, when I first came up, I, it, you know, I had these older crew members, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sure it's the same way in the UK as it is here. Like, you know, seasoned guys and girls, they can smell you coming from a mile away. Uh, and yeah. actors are no no different. So they'll they'll test you within the first five or ten minutes, mm -hmm. and they'll go, okay, he knows what he's doing, or okay, she knows he knows what she's doing. How do you handle first the acting situation, and then also just with crew members? Because I think that's super valuable, especially for young um, filmmakers coming up. Okay, first of all, I would probably say that I've had the privilege of working with a lot of good actors who aren't like that, and I normally and I could put it down to if they're confident. And, they, and they, they know their stuff. They've got nothing to prove. So there's no ego. So therefore, they don't, they're not difficult. If they're nervous about something, they're worried about that big emotional scene coming up. They, don't, they haven't really learned their lines. They're a little bit anxious about it. That will come out in one way or another, which is probably animosity towards you. Um, and, and any of the good actors, and I mean good as in their performance, they're also the ones that turn up on time carry the cases, make the coffee or whatever they, you know, when they're not working. And there's a correlation there. There really is. Mm. Um, and it's always the difficult ones. It's, it's funny. It's those what they call the enemy of production, where there's always one person, whether it's an actor, crew member, who will derail your film unless you 
isolate them from a point of view of work out who it is and you need to pull them to one side, offset and say, is there something that I can help you with? What seems to be troubling you? Can we talk about it? Is there anything I can do? Um, you know, I'm sensing something that you're not happy. Can I help? And just bringing it op- out into the open sometimes, especially with crew members, is, is that's the way to go because then they realize they've been rumbled. Mm-hmm. Killing with the kindness and you're saying, hey, look, I've, I'm letting you know that I've noticed your behavior. Hey, let's all get on. What what can I do to help you? If there's something that you're not happy with, let's talk. And you've kind of, they can't in theory then continue to be a jerk about it because you've already pointed it out to you've them. You've called them out on it. You've called them out on it. Um, with actors, I think it's, again, I think if we can find that thing that's troubling them, so you need to speak to them offset mm-hmm. and let them know that they can mention it. They're not, you don't want to do it in front of the DP. You don't want to do it in front of another actor because they might be embarrassed or what's troubling them might be the person that's stood next to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just say, look, everything all right because I'm sensing this thing. And again, once you've called them out, it's, it's you know, you're all, you, you know, you want to make it, you're trying to make the film uh, the best it can be. You need their help to do that. Um, and it's just about getting them on side. Um, failing that, if, you know, you just want to get as much coverage as you can to try and cut it. Or cut it. It's, a, it's a sad thing, but it's one of those things where you need to say, well, if they're not cooperating, mm-hmm. how can we still make the scene work um, uh, and, and, and just work with them? Really? Do you feel that I think I, I've had this experience, but do you feel that when actors feel that they're not safe because it's our job to give them a safe space to play, yeah. if they feel unprotected, if they feel unsafe, many of them, well, some of them will just go introvert, but a yeah. lot of them will come out and will will create problems, create havocs, because then at that point they're in survival mode because they're yeah. exposing themselves so much out there. That if like if this guy or this girl does not have my back, I gotta take care of myself. So screw everything else, and that's when the problems start. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah. Uh, I was just trying to think of something else then as an example. Sorry, dude. Um, no worries. Just repeat that back to me again. That when when actors are feeling uh, that they're unsafe. They're not safe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's I've made that mistake before actually where the actor's very feeling very vulnerable. They've just given me the performance that I want. And what I've done is that I've I've kind of got, oh thank God we've got the take. Right, let's move on. And I'm talking to the DP. But now I find the time to go up to the actor and go, That was awesome. This, that, and the other, you nailed it, da 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 da. Is there another take you want to try? Do you want to try a different way? Because obviously that was the way that I asked you to do it. Is there another input? And they think, oh, no, no, no. If you like that, that was fine. Mm-hmm. Rather than, uh, you know, they feel like they they want to give it another go, but a different, a different way. And there was a tip that I picked up from Spielberg, actually, where I was watching the extras on Catch Me If You Can with DiCaprio. Mm-hmm. And he's saying that they would do all these takes the way that, Spielberg wanted DiCaprio to do it and at the end Spielberg would just say right dude just do another one but go crazy mm-hmm. do something outrageous yep. and he would say that in the edit nine times out of ten they would use the outrageous take because there was no inhibitions DiCaprio felt free but it was just the fact that he had been listened to the actors need to know that they put their point of view across um, and sometimes I've had suggestions from the actors that I want to go with and I might make more of a thing of it to the crew that we're going with the actor's suggestion just so they go, hey, everyone, this idea was from this actor. Isn't it a great idea? We're now going to shoot it this way. And they kind of feel a little bit, hey, I've put some input in here and everyone knows it. Mm-hmm. And it's a little bit manipulative, but you are protecting them in, and you're also uh, – you know, bigging them up really. It is it, so much about filmmaking is psychology, uh, in, yeah. the, in, in how you produce it, how you find the money for it, how you yeah. actually shoot it, how you edit it, how you distribute it. Um, and, and also just the psychology of telling a story with subtext and, and, and creating different, uh, you know, th- you know, things and all that kind of stuff when you're, when you're doing stories, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, and I think filmmakers really don't get that across they don't teach that in film school that psychology right. should be a prerequisite 
in yeah. any, any and all film schools. Would you agree yeah. on that? It's like 50% of the set because you've got a psychology going on with the crew. Mm-hmm. You've got the actors with the director. You've got the director and the execs. You've got – it's all it's all egos. It's Has he or she had her input? You know, it's – I don't know. It's like – you know, it's the classic story of as well of like the editor and the director leaving in shots that they know to be bad mm-hmm. or yeah. – over long so that when it goes up the chain to the producers and the execs oh yeah they go don't like that shot take it out good idea thank you very much producer b we'll take that great example the great you know input and then you take out the shot and they everyone feels that they've been heard and the danger comes is when you present someone with an edit where it's in a really good place and if they're insecure that they need to make changes, otherwise they feel that they haven't been heard, you're going to be damaging the movie. Um, and then you're into a battle there. So you almost want to go, well, let's leave in that shot. That piece of information is redundant in that scene. So we'll leave that in. And then if no one picks up on it, you can take it out anyway. Right. And that's that's a piece of advice as, a, as an editor. For so many years, I would leave mistakes in. I would For yeah. the client, I would just you – know, doing yeah. commercials or doing music videos, I would leave – a mistake, like something so obvious that be like, oh, it's just, it's just so they have something to justify their job. Yeah, yeah. You know? And, 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 and all credit to a producer. I think it was, again, Spielberg. He, Sam Mendes was saying in an interview that when he showed Spielberg American Beauty, the one note from Spielberg, well, who's the exact, because it was the movie through DreamWorks, he said, don't change a frame. Now, co- the, the confidence from Spielberg he could have said, well, look, I would have done it this way. You want to tighten up that scene, da 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 But Spielberg had nothing to prove. He didn't need to show Sam Mendes how to make films. Yeah. His only note was don't change anything. Because and he's Spielberg. Was, <laughs> because he's Spielberg. But also it's like I don't, need to, I don't need to show you that I'm Spielberg. Yeah. I don't need to prove to you that I know my stuff. And I think that's such a valuable thing. And if I, if I come across – crew members and producers especially and i'm saying hey i had nothing to add to that skype call i had nothing to to amend because i think what it is is it's in a good place right now you know that's that's really good because then when they do have a note you listen Mm -hmm. Um, and i've also like you how i'm sure we've all had the notes when someone would just say oh it's a bit long and you go okay well is it long and they go well you know just generally and it's like (laughs) Just cut off 10 minutes. I need you to cut off 10 yeah, minutes. I'm like, it's, just, it's a generic catch-all, here's my input. Right. Because anything can be shortened. But if you said, you know what, at the end of scene six, when he leaves the house, I thought there's a couple of shots there that dragged. Mm-hmm. And it's like, cool, that's, that's probably good points. Let's look at that. Right. But just to say, oh, it's a bit long or I don't know. It's just it's, you kind of have to go, what? It, you know, It doesn't feel right. <laughs> yeah. And it's... <laughs> <laughs> like that yeah, scene, you know that scene. I'm just not feeling the vibe of it. I'm not getting the emotion of it. I'm like, g- g- give me something else to work with yeah. here, man. Yeah. Please. It's, it's important, actually. Feedback is a big thing. Yeah. And if you've got edit, you need to find a select group of people that are filmmakers that have you, they've got nothing to prove that you trust their feedback um, and that they have a trained eye. It's really important, I think, this, if the, and to have a trained eye is a really good phrase uh, because otherwise, you know, you're sending – I've worked in the past. I've worked with producers that haven't produced much of your, and they're looking at the script and they're saying, oh, I think this. And it's like, do you know what? You haven't got enough experience to justify what you're saying. You're almost repeating something that you've heard Christopher Nolan say or you've, you've right. just hearing – you're just repeating something because you feel you need to give some input, but you haven't done enough to base that experience on anything. Um, and, and you kind of, you, I think it's important to be wary of, of those sorts of people and, and, and just find, well, just find that group of filmmakers that know film right. uh, and can give you uh, some good, honest feedback. It's really important. Well, the one I, the, the, the group that I've put together and it seems to have worked for me on my features is I get a, a screenwriter a cinematographer, a director, and a producer. And, sure. and, and that really gives you a perspective 
because they'll yeah. only they, and an editor, excuse me, and an editor. So yeah. they'll look at it from a completely different point of view, each of them, and yeah. really give you a good rounded, you know, like the DP would be like, why did you shoot that like that? You should have done this yeah. or that. I'm like, yeah. but does it work? He goes, yeah. yes, but I would have done it this way. And then the edit was like, the editor would say something else or the screenwriter will say, but it really does give you a really good, well-rounded uh, feedback. Yeah. So it does yeah. work. That works for me as opposed to just, uh, filmmakers are great, but when you have some like people in their specific yeah. niches, uh, it really does help. Would you? Absolutely. I think that does, that, that's totally, totally true. Um, and also I think it's important not to go necessarily from the opinions of those that worked on the film. Oh God, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, you know, I remember giving feedback on a movie once. This is about 10 years ago. And a friend of mine, we gave some feedback and, um, the composer was in the room and he walked out halfway through our feedback and he was saying, don't listen to what they're saying. They're going to ruin the movie. And I'm like, yeah, but dude, you know, the story so when you and I say I think I say this in the book where it's almost like this jigsaw puzzle of fifty percent, you have fifty percent of the information because you know the story. So when you watch the movie, which is the other fifty percent, it makes one hundred percent and the story makes sense to you. I've only got fifty percent, which is the film. I don't have the story. I wasn't privy to the production meetings about what this means and what this person's you know what's the meaning behind that line and what this scene is there for. You were, so you have that information when you watch the film and it all makes sense. Mm. But I'm telling you, it doesn't make sense from my point of view. I don't know why that character's doing that. The editing suggests that he saw what she was doing when actually they didn't. Um, and it's important to find and, and to, to find those people that are filmmakers but necessarily weren't involved in the movie because they have seen it so many times that mm-hmm. they need the story. I, I would you and also I, I mean I edit my stuff. I'm assuming you do as well. Uh, but sometimes, and I've gotten a little bit more disciplined over the years, is that if you're on set and it took you five hours to shoot a shot, and you're in the edit and you're like, "But it's not working!" Oh! And somebody and I did it when I was younger. I would let things sit because I'm like, "But that shot cost me ten grand. I can't. Yeah. I can't I just. Yeah. I can't just cut that." To get yeah. someone else's perspective who's not involved, who wasn't there, and they could look at it yeah. and just go, dude, the shot's too long, man. You got to cut that. But it was the crane shot that I jumped <laughs> off with a steady cam and then jumped yeah. on a helicopter. It was great. I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't do anything for the story. You need to move on. <laughs> yeah. Been there. Been there. I'll tell you, we made a sci fi movie last year or the year before, um, and we had a shot. It's now a movie, it was a web series, but we had a shot in there, which is in a visual effects shot that took 18 months. Oh, that hurts okay because the post the post was quite a long schedule anyway but we were doing from start to finish it was about 18 months and it was a plane it the plane flew over camera and then it continued to fly the next shot was the plane coming into view and its wing would clip the side of this building and this glass was falling down and stuff and then we finally got it it was a and there was a, in the, the background plate for those that know visual effects, we had a crash zoom. So the, the CG plane had to also be shrink in size to match the plate. Anyway, we stuck it in the edit and we went, no, it just didn't work. The, the, the previous shot of the plane flying over camera was the out. Mm-hmm. That was the end. And then to cut back to this plane. And it was, it was painful because we were like, yeah, but it took 18 months <laughs> to do. And it cost X amount of dollars. It cost X amount, but we just kind of, and, and then I showed it to the sound mixer because he had seen the rough cut and the new cut. And he went, oh, you've, you've chopped the second plane shot. And I went, yeah. And I was about to go into the story of why. And he went, yeah, I didn't need it. And he came in straight away and said, yeah, I didn't need it. You're like, oh. Yeah, that's always a painful. <laughs> it's- my VFX guys just aged about 10 years because I've been putting through oh, all this. I've gone through that with my VFX guys as well, my friend, which is a great segue to your new book that just came out or is coming out re- uh, soon as of this recording coming out very soon called Making Your First Blockbuster. Yeah. And uh, for first of all, how – that's a. I haven't seen that before. I haven't seen a book with that kind of title before. So I'd love to know what it's about and what inspired you to write it. Okay. Well, basically, making your first blockbuster is obviously it's 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 a two pronged title. One, it's whatever your blockbuster is. Mm-hmm. So you could be making your 
50 million pound movie or you could be making your you know five thousand dollar movie or whatever it might be it's your blockbuster um but basically the way i pitched it to michael vc was i want to write the book i wish i had when i was 18 Mm -hmm. uh and that refers to not only writing producing lighting and stuff like that but the kind of things that we were doing we're making movies when i was 18 we were making action films. We were trying to do explosions. I was running around warehouses with blank firing guns. I was doing firecrackers on the wall, trying to do that stuff. Um, and I, you know, some of it worked, some of it didn't. I shot things badly. I didn't get the coverage, uh, all of that kind of stuff. So I pitched it to Michael, and I think I really loved the email he, he sent back to me because I said I pitched him, and the email came back about 20 minutes later and just said, I don't like it. I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Michael. But I think the love it bit was about four lines down. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and he's a right user. Anyway, but it was, I, I tell this story, one of the things, I tell the story in, in the introduction where I was, when I shot this movie, I was, was I 18 and I wasn't driving yet. I had a friend of mine who was driving because I hadn't passed my test. And we spent the day running around this warehouse uh, with blank firing guns. And we would like fire off these uh, blanks. And I had this, I was the, in the movie because that was my back in the day when I was acting. And I had this uh, PPK strapped to my chest in this gun holster, running around all the rest of it, all day under my jacket. And then as we finished shooting, my mate turns to me and he says, oh, look, you've been dri- I've been driving you around for a bit. Can I get some petrol money? And I was like, yeah, dude, fine. Pull over to this ATM and I grab some change for it. So I pulled over. The ATM was out of order. Of course. So I had, to, I had to run into the bank. So I ran to the bank, got some cash out, ran back to the car, which is has this engine running outside the bank. And as I get back into the car, this blank firing PPK falls out of my pocket. And I've just ran to the bank with a loaded blank firing pistol strapped on my chest. And my heart just froze. Oh and I was God. like, I, I don't see a way out of that. I mean, I would... I would I would have to say to them, look, I, we're making a film. Uh, here's the footage. But anyway. But, 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 you, but, but you were just pulling money out, like legally. Money yeah. Out. yeah, you didn't rob the bank. You just walked. No. But it didn't look good from someone looking outside. Yeah, but I mean, if the gun had fell out as I ran into the bank. Right. And then I kind of picked it up and, I don't know, hurriedly put it under my jacket. CCTV would have caught. But afterwards, <laughs> you see this bank. Jeez. I'd say I went white. Oh, I sure. White um, but anyway, what happened? So how how to fire, store, and use blank fire and weapons is now a chapter in the book. Because, <laughs> but I, how did? Think, so what happened? Did anything happen? Nothing happened apart from I aged a few years. But <laughs> I, I, you know, it was just one of those things. But. I don't know, stuff like that. And, and, you know, I used to put firecrackers inside my Minelli and Falcon Star Wars toys and trying to blow them up and how to, how to make effects and how to do stuff. And so it was just all that stuff that I was trying to do as a kid that I've kind of learned how to do professionally. So I thought I would now put it into a book. Now, uh, can you give us a few tips on getting high-end visual effects on a budget? Because so many, so many filmmakers always are asking uh, well i'm a vfx soup as well so i've i've dealt with it with independent and specifically in the indie, indie world so i always get this comment it would always be this okay so this shot you remember the shot in avengers and i say stop right there <laughs> just stop you're making a twenty thousand dollar feature film yeah stop it yeah. any reference you give me to lord of the rings any reference <laughs> you give me to the matrix or marvel or any Disney like two hundred million dollar, just stop, just stop, because yeah. it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because they, you know, they're just like, can we get this thing with the Statue of Liberty? Like, no, you can't. Yeah. It's no, it's no. Yeah. Stop, stop, stop. yeah stop. No. So how can uh, how can filmmakers get good visual effects for a budget, especially when they're trying to you know make a blockbuster? <laughs> well, well, I think I, I really promote the idea that I think all filmmakers and directors should study and know what can be done with visual effects because, first of all, it can get you out the shit a little bit. It could be something, you know, painting something out or something that you don't, it's something that you think could be quite expensive, might not be. Um, but I think the first thing that I say with, with 
people dealing with visual effects is is kind of look around and see how the environment works. Look at light. Look at the way our eyes, you know, see things. Look at depth. Look at shading. Look at hazing, and just get an understanding of that. Um, but just knowing what can be done and what can't, using sort of CG, uh, putting small elements of CG into a live action plate, uh, is, it normally looks better than you know than like a live actor, like a CG plate. If you're trying to do too much CG in the shot, that's when it starts to look fake because your eye is seeing lots of, you know, all of the CG kind of computer generated stuff. A um, bit of misdirection, you know, it depends on what's in the shot. But if the shot's on for quite a long time, the eye's got time to look around the frame. But things have moved on quite a lot now. There's a lot of kind of, there's a couple of companies doing pre-keyed uh, sort of visual effects stuff like smoke and explosions mm -hmm. and muzzle flash things like that but one of the things that me and my visual effects guy do is we're trying the best way to make visual effects look good is to take the perfection out so say you've got muzzle flashes and uh, some some shell casings flying out the top of a gun you animate those shell casings coming out but maybe you you see the first one but the second one is too blurry and it's too fast so, and then you see the third one, you only just see the set, the fourth one, etc. But what most people do is because they're putting some kind of effect shot together, they want the audience to see every, every part of it. Mm -hmm. I want you to see my work. So I want you to see all four of those shells clearly because I want to show off what I've done. When actually, if that was shot live, you would only see, like I said, the first one, the third one, maybe the fourth one. The fifth one would go in a crazy direction, different to the others. Um, so, you know, it could be little bits of elements to take the perfection out. Um, and, and then look at color correction, look at uh, lights and darks and shadows. And another good way of doing it is adding depth. Um, anytime I do a visual effects shot, I like to add some foreground because it looks like the visual effects thing that you're putting in. It could be a dinosaur. It could be an explosion. It could be anything sits better in the shot if it's obscured in some way by something else mm -hmm. rather than being plonked on top. So I would shoot a separate element of a side of a car or a tree or a stand or something, a sign, and I could literally then place that on top of the CG shot and it would hopefully make the CG blend a bit better. Uh, I, I, I would also add to that if, um, that if you can add visual effects to a practical shot already – Meaning, like, yeah. if you have a gun, I, I, I did, I did one of my short films had a lot of gunplay, and I had blowback on them. Sure. Uh, so I, I had the um, well, the airsoft guns. Sure. So yeah. I had blowback on them to give it some reason. So that practical mixed with a muzzle flash, yeah. Yeah. with some lighting effects, really yeah. sells it. You know, yes. like it's it, to create only fire that CG. Is tough yeah. even at the largest levels. I, mean, I, I still remember this one shot in The Rock when I remember that car chase in The Rock where they, it, it hits the the uh, the, the trolley track. and the yeah. trolley and the, and the trolley shoots up. That CG is so fake; it still drives yeah. me mad. Yeah. It's even difficult at that level. But if you yeah. have some fire to extend yeah. it, would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, you, you're basically augmenting what's already there. Mm -hmm. Um, another good, uh, another good tip is, um, well, like you say, sort of adding CG into the live action rather than the live action into the CG. But also, it's never just the explosion. Like if you put a fireball in a building or something, sure. it's the it's the effects of that. So the side of the wall will glow. Mm -hmm. There'll be a little bit of dust that will shoot out. There'll be a little bit of rubble. But when you see an explosion on film, your eye just sees the orange fireball. When actually what makes it real is the fact that, you know, that, that car next to it glowed a little bit orange. There's a, there's a dust cloud that very softly, very faintly came towards camera. And it's those little bits where the CG element has caused some kind of effect in the shot whether it's a shadow or something and it's interacted and it joins the whole lot together. And yeah, that's like, I think a big secret. Yeah, like ref like reflections are huge. Yeah. So if you have yeah. a fake, you know, um a matte painting, make yeah. sure it reflects properly on on a window 
or on a car yeah. window or in a mirror or even on like something that's metal. Just have it yeah. – that those little touches are what sell a final yeah. visual effect. And, and I think that's it. It's just making that – those little bits, it's those little elements plus taking the perfection out. Mm-hmm. Um, and my, my visual effects artist, we did a shot on a show where we had to film in a, in a rear view mirror of a car. And because on our, on the, in the UK we are filming on the right-hand side behind the driver's seat, um, we couldn't do that driving. So we did it stationary. And then we had to put in the shots of what the, the mirror was reflecting. Mm-hmm. We had to cut out the mirror and put the, the ground underneath. So we jumped in the back seat and filmed outside of a moving car so the angle was the same. But when we filmed out the reverse to, uh, of the back of the car to, to, to place in that layer of what the, it was reflecting in the, in the mirror, what Al, my visual effects guy, did, he took some dirt and grime and placed that over the reflected shot so it sold it like it was a dirty car mirror. And instead of it just being this crystal clear image reflecting it, reflected in the car window, it was actually the image was there underneath layers of dirt, smudge and black splodges. And, you know, no one's going to no one's going to see that. But the subconsciously, the eye goes, that's real because I can see some dirt. Because that's what it would look like in real life. That's how it would look like in real life. And also back, you know, like when... Jurassic Park or even when Star Wars and those kind of movies came out, people were not savvy. I mean, my wife, who's not in the business, will call out, that's a horrible comp. (laughs) Like she will say, she'll be watching, she'll be watching a big television show or she'll be watching a movie and she's like, that was horribly, that's a horrible green screen. Is that a green screen? That's a horrible green screen. I'm like, wow, you've been living with me way too long. But but people are much more savvy than they used to be about it. And even if they don't know the terminology, like that's a bad comp or that's a bad screenplay, a a green screen, they would just go, "Mm, that just doesn't look right. You know, as opposed to before anything was acceptable. Yeah, yeah. And I think another thing that's, I do mention this in the book, actually, that I think the secret also to doing visual effects stuff and Jurassic Park, which you mentioned, did so well with this, that all of the CG was shot from ground level. Mm-hmm. Right? Because that was the character's point of view looking up at the dinosaurs. Because at that time, ILM couldn't do the camera flying around everywhere because they couldn't do that stuff yet. You're but right. Spielberg came at it from a point of view of what does Sam Neill see? What does Jeff Goldblum see? Cut forward to 2005 with King Kong, and you've got Kong fighting the T-Rex, and the camera's flying up above through their legs around. And it's like the kind of the golden rule is if the camera couldn't do that physically, the CG camera shouldn't do it. Because that's one of those things where they go, yeah, I'm being drawn out of the movie, that's CG, rather than uh, that looks real because that's what the camera would see if it was shot for real on live. Right. It, it, it's especially in something that's so practical, like it, the camera goes inside of Kong's nose and then comes yeah. out. Like it's like yeah. mm, that's probably not going to fly. That being said, what an amazing fight sequence! It was, it was brilliant. <laughs> the if CG, you, yeah, the CG was awesome. But oh my god, was- what an amazing that movie had insane CG. But you know, Weta was doing it. You know, and it's yeah. it's Peter Jackson with all his toys. <laughs> <laughs> but I think coming back to your first question about how do you make it look real, how ask the question, how would you do this if it was if it was live? Yeah. And if we we're filming that explosion, you're filming that car, you're filming that even if it was a spaceship landing and hovering above whatever the you mm-hmm. know, the roadside, if that was live, what would you do? I'd put the camera here, it would be handheld, I would do this, I would have these people in the foreground, I would shoot over their shoulder, etc. Right. Have that shot, write down those elements, break the shot down and go, right, we need a background plate of the roadside. We need the CG ship. We need the over the shoulders of these people. So that might have to be green screen. And then you can layer the comp up and mm-hmm. then you can make the work. And then, you know, adding those extra bits, like if it's handheld, that looks kind of a little bit of the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and like I mentioned earlier, we had that plane coming over. We actually had a crash zoom which caused half the problems because the CG obviously has to track that. <laughs> but it adds that little extra spark to say this was shot live because we only just managed to grab this shot. The camera was in too close and the cameraman had to zoom out really quickly because the action was happening for real. And subconsciously that comes across that sells the visual effect. 
Now, I somewhere in in one of your books there was a chapter title, and I, I had to I had to call you on this because I think it would be sure. great. What are the three secrets of filmmaking? <laughs> right. Okay. Because well, I, t- I would love to know. Okay. Right. Well, I, I hate to disappoint, but they're nothing particularly sexy. <laughs> and th- that's good. People are always yeah. caught up with like, oh, look at the cool Alexa with the cook lenses. Yeah. It's like, look, dude, just that's that's a sexy part of filmmaking. Yeah. Well, anytime this has come out of uh, my teaching, really, and my you know working in uh, my own experiences and working with a lot, you know interviewing and speaking to a lot of colleagues and things like that. So, the first thing is is to shoot as much as you can. Mm-hmm. Like, grab a camera and shoot. I know that's a cliche because everyone says that, but I speak to student filmmakers and they're not filming enough. They're not filming. You know, I used to. I used to shoot, you know, I used to gab my camera when I was like 13, 14 and just pan around my bedroom. I'd film my posters, I'd film my models, I'd film the cat and it would just be using the kit. You know, that pan is a bit jerky. Why is the autofocus doing that? Why is the outside looking blue now? When all, I right. film the, all that kind of stuff. And I would shoot. And this is a good example. That I say to my students, I would film my cat walking through the house and it would be a handheld low shot. And I would spin around in front of her and all this kind of stuff. And I would know how to move the camera without necessarily looking through the eyepiece, knowing what that I was getting the shot. Mm-hmm. Cut forward 20 years and the director might go, can we get a low shot of the villain's feet walking in the hotel? <laughs> and I go, yeah, I've done it. Because I shot my cat 20 years ago, <laughs> filmed my cat. Um, and, it's, and it's just about filming as much as you can. And, and, you know, if you've got this short film idea that maybe – I mean, I know Rodriguez used to say this, but, you know, say your parents own a flower shop, yeah. but they're shot on Sunday, make a short film 10 minutes long about a flower shop and you have two actors and we're going to, we're going to film it. It's now early January. We're going to film it end of March. So we've got three months to write the script, find the actors. And we're going to make this movie by summer. It's going to be cut and it's going to be into festivals. Um, and, and it's just people aren't making enough. And I think you need to know kit. You need to know focus. You need to know what storytelling is and shooting helps you do that. Okay. Um, the second thing is to read. Oh God. Yes. Um, and obviously coming from a point of view of being an author, it's kind of like, I'm not watching that, but, but not just read, but just not read film books and screenwriting books, yeah. but read about life, yeah. about every genre all, in the world. All of, all of that. So I make a joke where I started reading when I was 25 properly. I was reading before that. <laughs> just, me, me, me too. Me too. I, I didn't read a whole heck of a lot till I was like no, maybe mid twenties. No, I didn't read in school. I didn't read, but then I started reading when I was about 25 and I started reading psychology books, mm-hmm. business books, filmmaking, spelling books, which is going to come on to all this kind of stuff. But I would read, you know, I'm self taught. I didn't go to film school. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm completely self-taught. I found a cinematography book in, in a bookshop here and I picked it up and it was a lot to do with film, a lot to do with light meters and I didn't know any of that stuff. But then I just bought more books, uh, editing books, directing books, writing books, you know, the classics, Rodriguez's story, you know, story, all that kind of stuff um, and just read, read, read. Uh, and it's funny, when I go to colleagues' houses, I've got a few cameramen that I know are in their 60s and 70s and you go to their study and what's behind the study? wall and wall of books cinematography books uh autobiographies you know uh script writing books there's all there and it's all that wealth of knowledge at your fingertips and and no one buys the books to read and it's, it's just a wasted resource so that's what i push and then the third thing is something called get your shit together <laughs> okay which is basically get your shit together covers everything about you so that's your timekeeping, mm-hmm. uh, excuses, emails, dress and appearance, areas you need to improve on and things like that. Because we talked about politics before, but it's like I'm not a particularly strong, you know, uh, my, 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 my writing skills. It's got better recently, obviously, with the books. But, you know, my spelling isn't that great. My grammar isn't that great. So I went out and bought books on grammar. Uh, you know, how to write, you know, you don't want to write that email to the publishing company or that DP you want to work with and you it's littered with spelling errors mm-hmm. or you spell his name wrong. I've had that before. I've had writers write to me and they spelt the, the, their own project wrong. And it doesn't, it doesn't look good. Um, right. It's not professional. So, 
it's not professional. And 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 timekeeping, turning up late, and there's basically no excuse for anything. I had a student once who was coming to set. We were shooting this short horror film, and we were filming at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. And she, this is, I've never seen this before. It was brilliant. She turned up on time, and then I found out she drove to set the day before just to find out where it was. Wow. And it's like that's so simple, but. I've had other students that are calling me at quarter past call time, quarter past nine, going, my sat nav, my, you know, it's held me down the wrong road. I was stuck in traffic. I'm right. really lost. Where are you? And I'm trying to direct. And, I'm, and uh, I've got a student on the phone. Uh, I'm trying to direct her as well or him. Mm-hmm. And that notion of going, oh, I'm going to find out where it is. I'm going to get up earlier and allow for the traffic. I mean, one of the other things as well is like dress and appearance, how you appear on set. Mm-hmm. I had a camera system once. We were, a, we were filming in a basement in <laughs> July, and there was room for about four people in there. It's and so there were seven hot. people in there. <laughs> and the kid stinks. He yeah. didn't. He hadn't showered. Yep. Yep. I've had. And I've I'm been right, there. I've been there. He's a focus puller. I'm right next to him. And then halfway through the day, he goes, "Oh, I'm just going to pop outside for a fag." Oh, so then he comes back. By the way, everyone and, talking, a fag is a cigarette. A cigarette. Yes. <laughs> a cigarette. And then he's breathing cigarette smoke on me. Or, you know, he's, it's all this kind of yeah. thing where you're going, dude, you're not helping yourself here. What's going on? I'll never hire that person again. Is he good? He might be fantastic, but he stinks. He stinks. But it's a camera, it's a cooperator and a DP. I don't want to be coming up for air in between tanks. <laughs> So where can people find uh, these resources, these amazing resources uh, that are your books? Um, Amazon's the best place. Okay. I think. Yeah. And I think in the States there's Barnes & Noble. Uh-huh. Um, but um, Anywhere books yeah, are sold pretty much. Pardon me? Anywhere books are sold pretty much. Yeah. Anywhere the books are, uh, are sold. And I think uh, it's just – I don't know. I mean I didn't do it. There's no you know sort of great deal of money involved. I just wanted to kind of give something back and I mm-hmm. think – one of the best things I've ever had, I had, I came off a plane once, I turned my phone on and there was a student in a place called Burlington, New Jersey, <laughs> Yeah, found my book in a library and she took a picture of it and she tagged me in it and she said, I've got this to read for the weekend. And I was just like, oh my God, that's, that's amazing. I don't even know where that place is. I don't even know who you are, but she's got the book. Hopefully she gets something from it. That's great. Um, yeah, and it was awesome. That was the biggest reward I've ever had. That's it. It is. It's really. It's. It is really rewarding when you put out work and it reaches people that you have no idea how it got there. Yeah. And 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 with this podcast, I mean, it goes around the world, and I get emails from countries I can't even pronounce, and sure. it's wonderful that that sure. that what the work that we do and this interview will be listened to by by thousands of people around the world that. Well, I just, it's fascinating to me, but the first thing is you just have to do the work, get it out there and the universe will take care of the rest. Yes. But when it comes back and someone says, oh, I've now learned this or because of a podcast, I've now just made my film here or I've now Mm -hmm. got this released. That's that you can't put a price on that. Mm -hmm. And anyone that's not done it can't understand that very well. Mm -hmm. They haven't had that feeling of what that means when someone say, Hey, You know, I was thinking about giving up, but then I read your thing or, you know, I was insecure about which direction to go in. And then I heard your podcast and so and so. And it's just like there is no you can't put a price on that. You you can't. And I tell you, once you feel it, it's addictive as hell. Yeah. It's like once you start it, you're just like, I want to keep I I like this feeling. I'm just going to keep keep going down this road. So Um, now I'm going to ask you a quick a few quick questions. I ask all my guests um, kind of like a fire, um, a rapid fire questions. So first thing that comes into your head. What advice would you give filmmakers wanting to break into the business today? Uh, shoot as much as you can. Okay. Can, my, my three secrets, shoot and read. Shoot, read, and, and, and wash yourself. Yeah. <laughs> hygiene, hygiene, hygiene. Um, <laughs> can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? I'll tell you there was two. Okay. If I can have two. Sure. One's film-related and one's not. When I said I started reading when I was 25, mm-hmm. <laughs> my sister bought me a book called The Road, a Road Less Traveled. Yeah, it's a great book. It's awesome. Yeah. And it was one of those things where every single page, I was like, oh, my God, that was brilliant. 
Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. that's so great. Isn't that an amazing feeling when you read a book like that? You're like, this author gets me. I, it's yeah. like, oh, my mind is blown. It was. And literally, I, my, I could sense after I read that book, my brain, my approach, my thinking just shifted. Mm hmm. I saw things differently. I was, I could see objectively. I could see other people's opinions. It was just completely opened up, mm-hmm. and I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And then that led me on to read more psychology books. And but obviously, all that infers your writing and infers your directing of actors and what makes that performance work and all that kind of stuff because you're understanding human nature and psychology. Um, the other book was the classic uh, Adventures in the Screen Trade. Ah, oh, Goldman. Goldman's book, yeah. and I had a friend God of mine awesome. at college, uh, uh, Mike Grant, who's a bit of a mentor to me, and he was an older student, and he said, dude, you got to read this. Uh, and I read it, and I, I broke the back of the spine broke, everything, so I just read it all the time. But it became such a Bible for me about what, you know, is acceptable, what, how you can approach things, what's, you know, just to understand even just from a confidence point of view, just to hear an established writer say, I struggle with this, mm-hmm. or that I had a problem with this scene, or I could never crack this character or something, but just tools and approaches. And that was the beginning. That was the first film book that I got, which I then went, right, what else do I need to buy? Who else? Who is this guy that wrote the book, watches movies, you know, and, and then I bought all of his other stuff as well. So those are the two books. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Okay, the how, who someone is, mm-hmm. who they are, how they behave, that writing is on the wall extremely early. Trust that inner gut that okay. says, I don't think you're going to pull, I don't think you're going to deliver, I don't trust you, um, there's something about you I can't quite put my finger on, but and, and I would say nine and a half times out of ten, I've been right with that. And I've second guessed it, I've dismissed it i've put it aside and i've said no no you know even down to i've been on set on the first day and the producer and the makeup uh people they're late and i'm and they say oh sorry i'm stuck in traffic and i'm like okay cool and we start the day late they are stuck in traffic and then the second day they're late and then the third day they're late and then the fifth day they're late and you see that it's a pattern and it's like was it traffic or was it them so that first i think malcolm gladwell because of like thin slicing he calls it where it's mm-hmm. like that first impression you get and just to trust that trust that gut and the more difficult question three of your favorite films of all time <laughs> okay uh it's oh, they're all from they're all from my childhood i think so the first one that really got me into movies mm-hmm. i think would probably be indiana jones and the last crusade okay yeah, I saw, I love that movie. I saw that I in the theater. It was so great. It's amazing. I yeah. was 11 at the time, and I just couldn't articulate how it made me feel. I'd look at the photos. I'd get the poster magazine mm-hmm. and the group mm-hmm. and all that stuff, and I would look at the images, and I'd be like, I can't take my eyes off these images. What is it about these images? And now I look at it now, and I know that it's, there's a bit of diffusion. There's, amber, there's some amber backlights. Mm-hmm. It, it's the depth it's this it's the colors it's the textures uh and it's all of that and i remember as well there was a little bit of the behind the scenes in the poster magazine where it would say indiana jones steps off a venice harbor walks in through the library and we shot that in uh in a studio in elstree in london so he goes from venice to london in a blink of an eye and in my head i was like what <laughs> No, how does that? No, but that didn't. How would that work though? Because his costume would have to be exactly the same, and uh-huh. he would have to be exactly. The, and my brain started to open yeah. up to the way the movies are made. Got it. And and it was just one of those things where I'm like, I can't, you know, get past it. And um, the other two, Back to the Future is probably another one. Oh, so good. Because well, I mean, I love the director Robert Zemeckis, but I remember watching it on like the hundred and eighth time or something, mm-hmm. and is racing towards the clock tower. Mm-hmm. And I realized that my heart was racing, but I knew the ending. That's a good so, movie. That's a good movie. And I would be like, so perhaps someone snuck in my bedroom, swapped the copies over, so now they've replaced it with a version where he doesn't make it. How am I still? How am I still emotionally invested? Right. If I the outcome. Or crying that, at a, or crying at a scene or something like that that you know 
it, what happens? And then you know it's yeah. coming. Yeah. And it's like, how is that even possible? Mm-hmm. So Back to the Future was a big, you know, mm-hmm. a big movie for me. Um, what else is there? Uh, well, I suppose there is the classics. I mean, like Star Wars as well was something that, sure. you know, because of, you know, and then I'm going to go past the three here, but there's things like Star Wars, Jurassic Park and things like that, where you kind of go, Wow, but I think another one for me actually was probably the Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, you, you you were right. I was about to say and Shawshank, <laughs> and and I tell you what, for Shawshank, we're talking about editing. I remember being in the cinema. Yeah, I watched it and I looked at my watch and there was only half an hour left, mm-hmm. and I remember being upset that there you didn't was want to only leave. half an yeah. hour left. Yeah, 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 and, and that's a perfect example of a movie that I've seen. I can't even tell you how many times I've seen that movie. Anytime it's on TV, I just sit there and watch it. We all know how it's going to end. We all know what's happening. But yet, when it happens, it's just so beautiful. Uh, It's just one of those movies that is – that movie is as perfect of a movie, you know, up there with The Godfather or something like that. It's just like one of those films that just – it's just perfection, The what what, what Darabont did. It, it, yeah. It's absolute perfection what he was able to accomplish. Um, and now, but by the way, where can people find you and the work that you're doing? Uh, okay, well, uh, my website is paulduberidge.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Hanover Pictures. That's spelled H A N O V E R P I C T U R E S. So yeah, that's Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I think it's Paul underscore Dudbridge. Okay. Um, but yeah, all those links should be on my website. Um, yeah, and the books are on Amazon, so that's where you can find my work. And Paul, I know we can talk for at least another two or three hours comfortably. I can see that. I've actually had to cut questions out because we just oh, have such a great time talking, and there's so many great knowledge bombs that you that you were dropping in this episode. So I want to appreciate. I want to thank you, and I appreciate you uh, you dropping all those knowledge bombs for the tribe today. So thanks again for your time, brother. Alex, thanks for having me. It's been great. Thank you, Paul, for dropping those knowledge bombs on the tribe today. I truly, truly appreciate it. If you want to get Paul's book, Making Your First Blockbuster, or his second book, Shooting Better Movies, The Student Filmmaker's Guide, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 311, and I'll have links to all of his books and his information there. And also, guys, just so you know, Shooting for the Mob is officially out. It is out everywhere. It is out in bookstores. It is out in Amazon and Barnes and Noble and anywhere you buy books. So please, if you really, really love what I do at Indie Film Hustle and what we're putting together, this book is going to create so much entertainment, hopefully a little bit of uh, inspiration, also a little bit of a cautionary tale of what not to do when you're chasing your filmmaking dream. And I think it's going to be really, really valuable to anybody trying to break into the business or even anybody who's in the business who just wants to read a heck of a good story. So check it out, shootingforthemob.com, and it'll go right to Amazon. And if you have read the book or you have purchased the book, first of all, thank you so much for your support. I truly appreciate it. Spread the word and leave a good review on Amazon. It really, really, really helps us out a lot. I am I am addicted to, to reviews. I need reviews on that. I need good positive reviews on Amazon. It really helps us up with the rankings. And uh, And we've already become a bestseller on Amazon. Thanks to you guys. So I truly am so grateful and so thankful to uh, to all the tribe. And we're just getting started. Please spread the word about the book to anybody and everybody who will listen. I truly, truly appreciate all the support, guys. And that is it for another episode of the Indie Film Hustle podcast. I appreciate you taking a listen. Hope this has been of value to you. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.